Welcome to part five of my Technical Analysis Foundation course, Moving Averages. This lesson is brought to you guys by Femex. I'll talk more about them later in this video. I'm really excited for today's lesson. This is gonna be on moving averages. These are one of my favorite tools to use. The best thing about them is that they make trend analysis really easy. If you haven't watched last week's lesson, you really need to do so before watching this lesson. I've said before that I wanna give you a really solid understanding of the basics because when we understand the basics, uh, when we move on to advanced concepts, we can make connections and intuitively understand the advanced concepts. So we're not memorizing them, we're actually understanding, them, able to apply them, adapt them, and be fluid, skilled traders. And that's the end goal. I'm going to get into the nitty gritty of moving averages. I'm going to talk a little bit about the formulas behind them. We're going to talk about exponential moving averages. Uh, trend analysis with moving averages, and finally, moving averages, a quick word on how they can be used in support and resistance. So I'm going to go over the usual disclaimers. This video is for entertainment purposes only. Any information spoken or written should not be interpreted as financial advice. Carry out your own independent verification of facts and data. Don't just take my word for anything. I am not a financial advisor. I do not hold any relevant qualifications. If you seek financial advice, speak to a professional. And finally, trading is an extremely risky activity. Your trades are your responsibility, so trade at your own risk. Let's start with what a moving average actually is. Here we have the formula for a moving average. A moving average is the sum of the last n close prices divided by n. Simple moving average, all the close prices added up, divided by n. n, number of time periods. So if we have a six moving average, here we will have a one, a two, a three, a four, a five, and a six. If we have a three moving average, it'll be a one, a two, and a three, all divided by three. Technically, this isn't just an average, it's an arithmetic mean, because an average could be multiple different things. So that's going to be important once we start talking about the significance of it being an arithmetic mean. Here's a diagram showing exactly what the formula was showing you before. Look at the close prices. A1, A2, A3, A4, and A5. All of those get added up. Then they get divided by the total number, which is five, and that gives us this input here. If we were to move this back one, then this four would become our A5, this three would become our A4, two would be A3, this would be A2, and then we take this close price over here as our A1, and that would have plotted this point, and every single point before that. In general, arithmetic means are useful because of a few reasons. What they do is they eliminate data anomalies. So this means if there's any data which is really far away from the mean, well, it's going to matter less because an arithmetic mean combines a whole bunch of numbers. So if something's really far away, it's gonna get drawn back to the mean by the other values which aren't anomalies. Next, it summarizes the data. It lets you interpret it really quickly. So you can instantly look at a chart and you'll know what the trend is. That is invaluable, especially if you're trading on lower time frames. and just generally being able to save time on trend analysis is an advantage to anyone. Finally, it gives a really accurate representation of large bodies of data. Just by looking at a naked chart, it's really hard to know what the past, say, 200 or 100 candles average out to. By getting the mean from this simple moving average, we can very quickly gain data over 200 candles. Understanding the moving average. Now that we know what it is, let's focus more on understanding it. You'll notice there are two variables we need to consider. Number one, n. Now, n gives us the number of candles the number of candle close prices which we bring into our calculation. Also, we have time frame. So the close prices, are they on the 15 minute chart? Are they on the one hour chart or are they on the one day chart? These are the variables we can adjust looking at a moving average. Now I'm gonna look into exactly what happens when we adjust these variables. What happens when we increase or decrease N? So N is our variable which determines the number of candles we're using. 
If we're using less candles, well, there's going to be less lag. Lag is because moving averages are a lagging indicator. They only give us information about what has already happened. If, say for example, we're looking at something with a very large N, like a 100 moving average. If the price suddenly jumps up and enters an uptrend on the lower time frames, the large moving average isn't going to pick up on that because the previous, say, 99 candles don't agree. That's what we mean by lag. It takes time before these larger moving averages can figure out what's going on. However, that makes them more significant. That makes them more accurate. They're less likely to make errors and get caught up. Now, the reason I have this here is to let you guys know that it's, again, not binary. You don't have just a large or a small moving average. You can have anything between one and a million. Obviously, a million is an exaggeration, but the point is there's everything in between one and however high a moving average you want to use. And it does not matter which specific one you use. In a lot of tutorials, people will tell you, use the 10, 15, and 20, and you'll be fine. Use the 10, 50, and 100, or whatever. But here, I'm giving you guys the tools to understand what these numbers mean and why the exact values are not very important. How does N determine lag? Let's get into mathematical description. And again, I'm going to follow up with images in case you guys aren't mathematically inclined. I know a lot of people really hate looking at formulas. They struggle with percentages, ratios. They learn a lot better visually. And that's why I've tried to include both examples. AN divided by N. This is going to be our last value which we calculate. So if we're looking at the six moving average, this would be A6 divided by six. And that's going to be the last figure which gets put in to our calculation. The larger the N is, the smaller the value of the most recent candle as far as it goes into the formula. So when N equals 100, your latest candle can only affect the price by 1%. Whereas when N equals 10, your latest candle can affect price by 10%. That's why as N grows, the lag increases. Here's a visual representation. We looked at this last time. We have A1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 5 is going to make a big difference. But look what happens when we have 10. Suddenly this figure doesn't matter as much because we have all these other figures which we're taking into account when calculating the formula. And that's the visual representation. You can see here, each of these matter a lot more than over here because we have so many of them. Right now, let's look at time frame, our other variable. I said in previous lessons, and I'll say it again, it's almost exactly the same every time. Higher time frames incorporate more data. They have less volatility. They are more significant. Lower time frames are the opposite. They incorporate less data. They are more volatile and less significant. When it comes to trends, also remember that higher time frame trends are made up of lots of lower time frame trends. Finally, we're going to look at the exponential moving average as well. This is the formula for exponential moving averages. Now, I know some of you will have struggled with the first one. So I know a lot of you are going to struggle with this one, especially if you're not fluent in reading mathematical formulas. So entirely ignore that. When it comes to teaching you guys the basics, I'm only going to teach things which are worth learning relative to the amount of effort you need to put in. So if you want to learn more about this formula and you're able to do it on your own, please go off and study in your own time after the lesson. That'll be part of your homework for this course. If you are unable to learn and study this on your own, then it's actually not going to be worth your time to learn. Just follow these rules when it comes to exponential moving averages. Assume all the same rules as a regular moving average with one key difference. The exponential moving average values recent data more than past data. So if we just go back a couple examples and look here, when it comes to an exponential moving average, A10 will matter more than A1. Here, all of these matter the same. So when we're calculating it, it's exactly the same across the board. When it comes to exponential moving averages, 10 matters more than 9, which matters more than 8, which matters more than 7, and so on. It's useful when you want your moving average to react very quickly to the recent data. It reduces lag 
but at the cost of some accuracy because it's extremely reactive to whatever the most recent data has been doing. Remember, all concepts we're going to discuss with moving averages apply to exponential ones as well. This is going to be the heart of the lesson, trend analysis with moving averages. This is my favorite way to use moving averages, and I've had a tremendous amount of success with this. Before we get into it, I'm, I keep saying this, I want to make more courses for you. I think these courses are better than most things you can find online. And for me to keep making them, it takes a lot of time and energy. And I, I don't want to charge you for it. I want to bring these courses out for free. All you have to do is use my link to Femex in the description below, and they'll sponsor me to make more free stuff for you. It's that simple. Okay, so trend analysis with moving averages. This is going to be the heart of the lesson. We're going to be using free moving averages in this example. We're going to use a short term moving average. What does this mean? Low lag, low significance. Medium term moving average, medium lag, medium significance. By now, you know what lag means. It means how long it takes for the moving average to adapt to the most recent data. L significance, I mean the weight we attach to the argument it gives us. Because the short term moving averages are more volatile, we're going to assign less significance to them. And as I hope most of you managed to guess, long term moving averages will be high lag and high significance. Which ones should I use? I've explained to you guys how varying n works. So you should understand, hopefully, that it doesn't really matter whether you use the 10, 50, and 100, the 13, 21, or 55, if you like the Fibonacci's, 100, 200, and 500, or if you want to use five different moving averages. Really doesn't matter exactly which ones you use. But a general rule you should bear in mind is if it's something you can do, with just three moving averages, you never want to be using five. So in the example I'm about to give you guys, we're doing some very simple trend analysis. There isn't much advantage in using five. I find I only really need three to get my bias in check. So the simpler, the better. The less variables you have, the easier it is to be consistent. And the challenge in trading is not in coming up with complex strategies. Remember the first lesson. The challenge is in risk management and psychology. When it comes to technical analysis, keep it simple. Find a strategy that works. So when looking at multiple moving averages, the most important thing is the distance between these moving averages. The further apart the moving averages are, and you'll see this in an example in a second, the stronger the trend. So when moving averages go really far away from each other, that means the trend is growing stronger. Next, when they cross, so when there's zero distance between them, that's also very important. If there are multiple crosses in quick succession, this is an indication of there being no trend. If crosses occur during a trend, but not with all moving averages, this could be an indication of the trend weakening. Okay, so here's an example of a really strong uptrend. We have three moving averages. The one at the bottom is always going to be a high time frame moving average. So this has a very large N. What exactly is it? It doesn't matter, that's irrelevant. And if you don't understand why it's not super important right now, go back to the previous parts of the video and pay attention. Here we have our medium time frame moving average. Here we have our short time frame moving average. Now notice how the short moving average moves a lot more than all the others. Then our medium time frame moves a little bit more. You can see it slowly going up and down, but our high time frame stays very consistent and true. When we have immediate drops like this, this is a lagging indicator. And because N is high, the lag is higher. So it doesn't react as fast to this data moving. Whereas our short time frame one reacts extremely quickly and quickly crosses over with this moving average to show us what's happening. Those are our moving averages. Clearly, we can see we're in uptrend because the short term is above the medium term, which is above the long term. It crosses over a bit as well. Here, the price dips below the short term. When the price dips below the short term moving average during an uptrend, this is our first sign of weakness. We can say it didn't quite dip below the medium term. You could say it acted as a support here and pushed the price back up. Did the same thing here, weakened and broke through. 
here we had a mini downtrend. But when looking at the macro trend, this crossover indicates a weakening of that trend. It strengthens again over here, weakens again over here. So here we can see the uptrend is still intact because the moving averages haven't moved below our high time frame moving average, but it has weakened. It's really as easy as that. That's how we use the moving averages. When it's above all of them, when the price is above all of them and they're all fanned out, you're in an uptrend. So I think you'll be a little clearer if we explain it in an example we've seen before. If you remember this from last lesson, this was our uptrend example. Higher high, higher low, higher high, higher low. Now here we have our downtrend. You can see uptrend here, downtrend here. And this space over here is actually where we had our consolidation. Now let's bring the moving averages in and see if we can analyze it better. Clearly, our uptrend is still an uptrend because all the moving averages are fanned out here. They stay above. We can see the trend weakening at this point and this point. And then we can see the trend collapse here where it enters a short term downtrend. And then here we can see confirmation of a higher time frame downtrend because all of the moving averages cross over and we can see it weaken a bit over here and then strengthen a bit over here. So uptrend, downtrend. Now let's look at this period here. Here we can see clear consolidation because all of our moving averages are crossing over. Here it's less clear. Downtrend, all of these three are fanning out. Remember guys, you're always playing trends within trends within trends. As far as the macro trend goes, first half of this consolidation was actually still a part of that downtrend. Only here did it escape that and did the macro trend also agree. And shortly after that, we entered our uptrend. And that is how you use moving averages to make trend analysis extremely easy and intuitive. We're just detecting when the price deviates enough from the mean for us to consider it an uptrend or downtrend. A summary of everything we've looked at. Use multiple moving averages with varying lengths. A simple formula for you to follow is to use a high time frame, a medium time frame, and a low time frame. That's for beginners. If you're more advanced, well, now that you have an intuitive understanding of moving averages, you can get creative. If you have a certain idea, think which moving averages would be most useful and then test them. We know we use distances between moving average to measure the strength of a move. Now, some people who are extremely analytical and systematic will maybe want to measure the exact distance between moving averages. Or if you're more discretionary, you can just judge the distance by eye and not look for exact levels. Remember, crossovers show the weakening of a current trend if it's during a trend. However, when every single moving average is crossing over, that indicates a neutral trend. Finally, we're going to discuss moving averages being used as support and resistance. I touched on this before, and you saw examples where the price touched a moving average level and then bounced. Well, the thing is, moving averages do work somewhat as dynamic support and resistance levels. Personally, I don't trade off them as support and resistance levels, but I do use them for confluence. Basically, any moving average you take, because of the way an arithmetic mean works, over a long enough period of time, it will end up looking like some sort of support or resistance level, but it can be used as confluence. And something else which I've noticed for sure is the stronger the trend, the more likely they are to hold. Because the further we deviate from the mean, the less likely it is we revert to the mean without some sort of bounce. Price rarely moves in a straight line. So as we're trying to come back to the mean, it's the further away we've gone from it, the more likely it is we don't come back in a straight line. Hopefully that makes sense, but it's not hugely important why they hold. Just know they do hold if you didn't understand that during a stronger trend. And obviously moving averages can be used as dynamic support and resistance levels. Have fun experimenting with that. Now for everyone's favorite part, homework. And don't worry, there isn't much for this lesson. It's quite similar to the previous ones. Take notes on what you've learned. If anything really helped you, make a note of it or you'll forget. Next, start to gain experience. I want you to go look at the charts. 
I want you to input moving averages and start adding that to your analysis. Gain experience using everything we've learned so far. Moving averages, support and resistance levels, concept of trends, candlestick analysis. All of these combined together will give you a powerful arsenal of technical analysis tools. Finally, watch the videos. I'm going to link in the description and you'll be able to see me using moving averages in my own analysis. This might help you get a better understanding. The theory is pretty good, including some examples, but actually seeing someone use them can be extremely useful. And a special thanks to the people who made this video possible. You have this free tutorial. Thanks to Femex. Use my link in the description below if you want to get more free tutorials.